Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And this week, we're doing another listener request. And it is a bit of a doozy in the psychological impact department. It is. We're going to talk about what happens when you're in a relationship and you're dealing with manipulative, meddling, meddling. troublesome in-laws or extended family the relationships that are sort of tacked on to the relationship that you chose yeah i think most of us have some experience with this in general whether that's during dating time or married time or watching our parents go through it sometimes we notice and watch in fact this shows up in um in sessions with, with my clients all the time where since we talk about what their parental role models were for relationships Often we overturn a rock and we're like, oh, and it turns out my grandmother didn't get along with my mother. And here's how that went down. This is everywhere. If if this describes some part of your relationship, I'm sure you know you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> and I, what I loved about this question is it was posed by someone who's been married for just a few months. So it's a, a new marriage. Um, and I, I think there's a tender time at the beginning of a marriage in particular, where we still really hope that everything will will work out the way we dreamed for yeah. it to. We, there's yes. like a, not so much resignation about like, oh, this is just what is. And that hope can be almost tragic at times. James Hillman is famous for saying, um, hope is that, that's the thing. That, that's that's the th- hope is the worst, just the worst. Um, and in some ways I agree because the hope that our partner will change their relationship with their parent so that we feel better. Well, it just doesn't happen that often. Yeah. And you mentioned the beginning of a, of a marriage, the beginning of relationships is very aspirational. Like, Oh, I think that we could, you know, a lot of, a lot of imagining into what could be and how it could be great and, and good and missing a lot of the, some of the complexities of life. And so here we are. And, you know, it is also typical, of course, that we don't remember to have the conversations early on that would lead us to understand our partner's perspective totally. There's a lot of rose-colored glasses stuff that goes on yeah. at the beginning, not just the beginning of marriage, at the beginning of dating, for instance. In fact, I wrote... I wrote a paper about this when I was 23 years old and I was, I was um, joining La Leche League and I was becoming a La Leche League leader, a breastfeeding mentor basically for, for other women. And I had to write a, 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 an essay describing something. And I started it off by saying, you know, when I met my then husband in high school, we didn't sit around the the high school cafeteria lunch table talking about things like, like breastfeeding and co-sleeping. But luckily, we agree on these things. I I found a point of real communion with my partner at the time in the fact that he was willing to totally get on board with the way I wanted to parent our kids. But we met when we were 15 and 16. There was no way we were going to have the foresight to have the conversations that needed to be had. But you and I met at 33. Well, we didn't meet. We met a bajillion years ago when I was a baby. But... We first became romantically (laughs) connected when you were 43 and I was 33. And we didn't have the conversations that would have led us to understand the complexity of each other's families, even though we'd known each other all that time. So, okay. No harm, no foul. You may not have had the conversations that would really get you there. But what do you do now? Because once you're in a relationship, I think the tendency that I see the most frequently is... For people to hope 
that their way, the vision that they had for their in-law relationships, for their partner to, to want the same thing for them. They, 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 you just hope for it. And yet in my experience, your partner learned to deal with their parents in a particular way. They have their own coping strategies, their own mechanisms for dealing with it, and just their own likes and dislikes. There can be stuff that you just don't like that your partner's totally fine with. Right. Um, They have their own relationship with those people. Right. And it becomes really problematic to, to, to be presuming that our partner is just going to automatically want the same things. Now, that said... (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, the word narcissism gets tossed around way too lightly these days. But let's go a step back from that. How about a, a self-involved person mm-hmm. or a self-aggrandizing person? If you happen to have an in-law or an extended family member who is a bit grandiose, a bit overly confident that they that their way is the correct way, and they specifically think that their way for you to live your life is the correct way. Yeah, man, that's, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. I, I get it. But the boundary setting opportunities here are actually brilliant. There is, there is actually a treasure trove of deepening for the relationship, like possibility. There's so much available. Conversations about boundaries are, uh, they're just rich in in deep in rich in opportunities to deepen your relationship. Right. And so when I think about dealing with boundaries around parents, I you know, I have my own my own stuff and I I found that because my parents raised me in a, in a very parentified way and I think that they would actually they're they're dead and gone but they I believe would agree that they did and it was to some extent intentional. I was an an eldest daughter in a family that was, that always raised their daughters to take care of the generations like that. That was my role. I was groomed for that. Um, So when it came time (laughs) to set boundaries, they had outfitted me with a brilliant set of very crisp and clear boundary setting tools. My words were sharp, overly sharp at times, and my ability to set those boundaries was very strong. And I'm betting a lot of our listeners, they get this. Like if, if you had some, some parentification, you may have those ba- boundary settings, but, but then they put in a back door where it was very difficult to set those boundaries with them. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember having conversations with my own um, father about this, about how it was hard for him to watch me become so strong and then be able to hold my boundaries with him too. And we essentially fought about that until the end, until he was gone. And I I don't exactly regret it. It was one of those aspects of our relationship where we simply disagreed about the way to be a person. And that didn't mean we didn't love each other, but we disagreed. And now the tough part, and you, you, you were involved in this, the tough part was how he treated you and your relationship to him, your relationship to my father. Yeah. Well, whose business is that? Is it my business? Is it your business? Is it our business? And then, so there was, there was me dealing with him, but then there was me watching him deal with you. And sometimes you watched him be highly problematic. Highly problematic. And who is that? My business is that whose business is that? Yeah. So when I think about this meddling energy that can come up, the first thing I want to, to know is what do you, what do you, how have you decided to set your boundaries around the influence of people outside of your relationship? And now this is an interesting conversation, no yeah. matter how your relationship yep. set up. If you're in a polyamorous relationship, then you probably have a similar conversation around where are your boundaries around other partners, right? But in a marriage that is two people, a monogamous marriage, um, you still have all of these other people who want to influence you. Right. We've had a lot of conversations about what it is that 
is challenging about having someone else influence you. And from my perspective, the hardest part is how scary it is. When another person can influence you, it can raise up all of my fears of insecurity. Mm -hmm. My fear that in fact, I won't be, I won't, I won't get my way. My fear that I won't be safe. This can get to existential level fear pretty fast. And when we're talking about a parent influencing a child, now that child is actually my spouse. Wow. There's a, there's a lot of, a lot of fear can enter the room really fast. Mm -hmm. Something that comes up a lot too is what does it mean to set a boundary then? How do we agree? How do we have conversations about our boundary setting that are generative rather than I need you to set this boundary and coming into the conversation just cold like there, that's what I need. I'm going to go back to something we talked about in an early episode when we talked about setting up for success in a tough conversation, because anytime we're dealing with this sort of meddling energy, we're probably going to have some complicated conversations. And that's where the juice is. Relationships are messy. That's not the problem. The problem is if we believe that it has to be smooth all the time, we're going to feel so miserable and uncomfortable and possibly unsafe. So let's set ourselves up for success. Let's deal with, let's halt hungry, Uh angry, lonely, tired, When you're going to have a complicated conversation, check in. Have it at a time when neither one of you is hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And some of those things can be addressed right in the moment. Make a snack. (laughs) Um, If you're already in another fight, calm yourself. And if you're in a fight about this, it's time to get yourself soothing out. Your your self-regulation tools, the things that, that help you get back to your center. Dealing with loneliness can be as simple as taking a minute to hug face-to-face, just just allow yourselves to co-regulate for a minute. And tired, that's about timing. When is yeah. the best time for these conversations for you? And this is where instituting a, a relationship check-in, like weekly, is mm-hmm. great because you can have that time set aside in your calendar at a time when you typically aren't tired, set up to, which is awesome. Yeah, avoid all of those things. So since we yeah. know we're going to have difficult conversations when we're talking about boundary setting, do that. Set yourself up for success that way and then now we have to find common ground the thing i missed the most in my first marriage was finding common ground i missed the mark over and over and over again i had been um, raised in a very in a, in a household that really encouraged a, a level of um of sharpness and and like sort of bullying through problems just just getting through and so I thought that I thought everything was a debate, essentially, right? And so I forgot that we had the opportunity, or I didn't even know that we had the opportunity to instead start with common ground. And this is where I ask people to remember what your relationship's purpose is. Like, why are you? There are two parts mm-hmm. to this. Why are you in this relationship as an individual? Why? What do you love about this person? And why are you in a relationship at all? And then two, what's your purpose? You and I have an established purpose, a a thing we're doing in this relationship. And we renegotiate it over time, but that purpose contains within it all the values that we have, all of our shared values. One of them is that we care, we care for our family. And so in the case of my father, when he, when it was difficult, we could come back to the shared ground of, okay, and we we care about family, so yep. we're so we have that to build on. So we had a values. We had something. Um, yeah, we had values to to lean on to to help hold up some of the more complicated conversations. Like, oh, we both believe in this and agree with it. We might and not even agree though it feel it. and and it might feel we might be feeling different ways about it, but we agree with the underpinnings. Right, and then. And this is another place where I, I think maybe you struggled with this as well, because you also had boundary setting issues, Yes. In especially in your first marriage. We have fewer of them specifically this way now because all four of our parents are dead. Uh, yeah, but, fewer um, opportunities. Right. And, and so we're a bit untethered that way, which has a, its own weird effect, which yep. we can talk about at another time. But when you were married the first time, you had your own issues and it was different. So in my first marriage, there was a lot of my, 
demanding that my partner make their parents change. Mm -hmm. So like make their parents change, like make their parents take me seriously and, and not overstep the boundaries and, and speak to me differently. I demanded it. And I wanted him to want that for himself too, but you can't want something for somebody you else. Can't. Or I guess you can, but you're not going to get it. Yeah. And, but you had it from a different angle. Yeah. So, well, my, uh, the way I look back at that, so I didn't do the boundary setting that I would want to now, if, you know, going back in time, I would have conversations about, Hey, so, um, here's how this is going for me and here's how I'd like it to go. What, can we do together? You mean you wish you'd had these conversations? I wished I, these are the conversations I would like to have What'd had. you do instead? Nothing at all. <laughs> I did not have any conversations. I did, I just, you know, gritted my teeth and went and did the very, very boring things and then experienced the- And so the, there's the thing, it wasn't, you weren't experiencing harm. No, I was not. But I, you I, weren't happy either. Right. So there are levels of this, but- um yeah but what there were it? no conversations there were no conversations about i mean there was the occasional conversation about hey so christmas is coming up are we really going out there again yes we are okay <laughs> rather than say well what if we didn't what if we did things different this time and here's why and then we could have had a conversation and um ultimately i also didn't have any conversations with um with her family to say, hey, what could we do different? This isn't a lot of fun for me. I get that, you know, you've got traditions and everything, but maybe we could do some things that I like to do. And so that is, I think, one of the the keys is figuring out that you have a relationship with these people right. too. Yeah. Something that happens a lot these days is the 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 presumption that once you're married, there's sort of this one this one personality that yeah. becomes like that the marriage starts to get its own. And I totally fell into that. It's part yeah. of why I didn't have those conversations is, oh, no, I, do, I don't get to speak for this relationship. So if, Wait, you're, if your partner is conflict averse yeah. and it and or they actually like the meddling because it might not feel like meddling to them. Yes. It might feel like care to them Feels because like that's what they were right. Yeah. They're looking for that. Yeah. And in fact, they may even like that very feature in you. Uh -huh. Oh, we could get a little inception here. Oh, yeah. You may, in fact, dislike this so much because, because you see yourself. You're projecting a little bit. And it doesn't mean that they're not. I definitely had this going on in my first marriage. Well, I did not enjoy the level of grandiosity of my mother-in-law because I have a level of grandiosity about me. And and then we were we were at a loggerhead, right? But once I learned how to relate to her, myself yeah. and set my boundaries while it was still difficult for me to watch the way she treated my husband it did change it did shift because i was starting to set my own boundaries and i there's a great so book that's good. there's a wonderful book out right now called set boundaries find peace a guide to reclaiming yourself by nedra glover tawab i I highly recommend people who are struggling with boundaries. The reason I recommend this one, there are a lot of boundaries books out these days, but I'm recommending this one because it's incredibly action centered. You open nice. up to a chapter and it's, you know, That's boundaries really with your family here. And, and there are even these examples. And I love, there's a sentence right here. It says, you become an adult when you set boundaries with your parents. Boom. Boom. Mic drop. Yeah. Now, I, I really do believe that we can learn to set boundaries at any age. So it's not like you're you're late to the party if, you know, you turned 18 and didn't learn how to do this. But I love that after that, she goes to great lengths to just outline, hey, this is what boundaries with your parents might look like. Cool. And these are the sentences that you might say. So if you have struggled with boundaries in a practical sense... Yeah, this is a great book. And this is a great book to bring into the relationship and and say, so here's how this might sound. How do you like how could we work with this? Because in that conversation, you may find that there is shared ground. And I mean, thank that's 
that's it. That's the game that's right the game. there. That's that's what finding you can build some on. shared ground. Yeah. And the particular question came in from somebody who was newly married, and I I just want to add this. Before there are children in the picture, there's one way that this feels. But I have a client right now who's right at the cusp. Um, he and his wife are thinking about having children, and he was raised in a family that where um, his mother was incredibly um, pervasively controlling, um, had controlled every aspect of his life. And now, as he begins this this journey toward fatherhood, he's recognizing that the work he's done over the last three years to set his boundaries was crucial, crucial. So if you are in that that in between time, I would encourage you to not wait. Some people wait and hope that the children that they have will sort of empower them yeah. to make decisions. You you had some of that. Like, well, oh, once we have the kids, uh, yeah. like we'll get to decide, right? No. No, yeah, do I the mean, work beforehand if beforehand. you possibly can. Because even even if the even if the kids do help you set your boundaries, that's not their role. I don't use them for that. Yeah. And I wanted to point out another uh, You may have done that. Land I may have done that. Um I did do that. And another landmine, another bad habit that I did was so I kept okay, I didn't I didn't want to do these things all, over and over again. Like activity, family yeah, activity. Family activity. I didn't I didn't want them to go that way. I wanted them to go a different way. And then what I did, how I resolved this. Oh good. <laughs> resolved, what I did was I resented my partner for not noticing that I wasn't happy about this and fixing it. Like that was my move. Highest of fives. Right? That's great. Oh. Uh, so I'm just going to say, watch for that. If you feel resentment coming up in these situations, watch to see if, have you done anything about it yet? <laughs> or are you, and it's easy to do, our, um, the, the modern and particular monogamous relationship has built into it this sense of obligation between you and your partner. And you may be leaning on that. I was, I was leaning on that sense of obligation and hoping that it would just hoping that it would just yeah. resolve because they would resolve it. Yeah. Well, and, and hoping it that was their parents, right. They should take care of that. No, it was my relationship. Well, my right. Experience. So it was your, and it was your relationship and, and, so there you go. Whose job is it? I do believe mm -hmm. that, you know, there is a level of sticking up for each other mm -hmm. that, that's reasonable. I was so grateful for you for standing in the face of, of some things that I had attempted to deal with with my father and he was not, he was not able to observe my boundaries. And you and made it possible by having the conversations with me about what about, was happening. Like, so I knew possible. what boundaries you were having that weren't being honored. Because it turned out that one of the problems he was having is was a, it was a patriarchal problem. Mm -hmm. He couldn't hear me say those things and he could hear you say them. Yep. And that made me sad because I don't like that system. And yet we were also dealing with the last years of his life. And sometimes you choose what works yeah. because that's what's left to you. Yeah. If you're in a position, though, to negotiate that with your partner, mm -hmm. Well, it actually, it did. It deepened our relationship yes. and I felt cared for by you. And I felt like you were caring for him because instead of me fighting with him, he yeah. heard you say a few sentences and said, okay, okay, I'll do that. Right. It's not a perfect world. It was never going to be. Nope. I couldn't get what I really wanted, but I got something and it allowed me to continue having a relationship with him. I'll take it at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I give you a lot of credit for seeing that you were struggling to actively have the conversations because I think that that's the hard part. It is. The hard part is not falling into the resentment game. Yeah. And I did that too. Like resented my partner for for not reading my mind. Yes. And for not feeling it the same way I did. Yeah. The bottom line right? is your partner wasn't bored at those events. No. No, that, like I said before, they still it go felt to those like events. home. They, right. So that's, that's great. And yeah. that's fine. That's not what they're like for Right. Me, so. so negotiating, this is a thing that comes up a lot around holidays, children, um, events, life transitions, but it can also come up around really benign stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have clients who have had parents who will just come over and like nag on everything. Just, they're mm -hmm. just cutting down everywhere. 
that's a time when I think, well, look to your own, look to your boundaries yourself. Look to your boundaries. What's going on? Is that, is that something you can allow in your space? It's really hard to set a clear boundary it like is. that. It's straightforward guidance that, that she's describing. Like you work on your boundaries, set, set boundaries, negotiate them with your partner and with your, your partner's family or whoever it is that, that you're having an issue with. It's straightforward guidance, but it's not simple. No, it's not easy. So what can we do to make it easier? One thing is we can we can prepare for the conversation. And another is we can do some aftercare. Yes. So the conversations between you and your partner might be hard, but then there are the conversations where you actually say the thing. Like, well, I'll just I'll just flip this book open. So if you said a thing to someone, well, I would have had to remember my here, glasses. Probably. You read a sentence. Just pick one from pick right one here. Of these things from over here. So um uh, I'd like to express my feelings without being told that certain emotions aren't okay. There you go. So let's say you or your partner are going to say that to a parent. That statement may that not looks, fly, right? Yeah, there may be some fireworks or right. uh, you know some sort of response. Or something really straightforward like, so we've decided to spend Christmas Eve with you and Christmas Day with her parents. And that's how that's going to go. And then there may be histrionics and fireworks and all kinds of problems. You may find that there now is a barrage of text messages and you have mm -hmm. to turn your phone to do not disturb. Stuff happens. Fallout happens. So if you can put in place an aftercare plan for each other, for how you come back together, because this may be really uncomfortable and may cause challenges that extend past the actual conversation. Aftercare may look like simply some soft time together, some some time to just allow each other to be like, this is sad, this is hard. Mm -hmm. It could look like re-watching your favorite show because it's predictable and you you know how it goes. How many times have we watched Shit's Creek because right. it's predictable and yep. we know how it goes. It could look like going for a walk together and just letting the silence hold you for a little while Something in shared that gets space. You back leaning on your your shared connection values whether you talk about them or not because silence sometimes will help sometimes that. that's the thing that touch yeah can those moments of coming back together when when one or the other of you is experiencing pain or especially if you both are but in different ways that's that's it that's the that's the key to building a conscious relationship, if you ask me. That's um, that's the opportunity that will come over yeah. and over again. Mm -hmm. It'll come on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Yeah. So I hope this was helpful. And I would love to hear if anybody has further thoughts on it. There'll be yeah. a post on Instagram. You can hop on over there yep. and, and post on it. Follow-up thoughts, follow-up questions. Absolutely. Always you can email any question that you have or a follow-up question about this or a totally new question at to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. Or nice if you want to send a question to me, I am Ken at <gasps> JolieHamilton.com. You finally have an email address. Yeah, I had it for a while, apparently. But okay. Yeah, there it is. So uh, anyway, you can find him separately. If, if you want you know, to, to connect to me directly, that's how you can do that. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>